In this morning from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, and from verse 17. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, from verse 17. Let's hear the word of God. Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, You have said it. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Then Jesus came, came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and two sons, the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The Spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak. Again a second time he went away and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? 
Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? How then could the Scriptures be fulfilled, that it must happen thus? In that hour Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the Scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled." Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Amen. May God bless his word to us this morning. Well, we've been looking at the life of Peter, and we continue this morning, but I'm going to say very little about Peter. But I want to talk about a vitally important lesson that Peter had to learn. And in this passage that we read earlier, Matthew 26, verse 47. While he, that is Jesus, was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, With a great multitude with swords and clubs came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, Put up your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? How then could the Scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? In that hour Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. In uh, the first book of Samuel, in chapter 14, there's an account of a great victory for Israel over the Philistine army. King Saul had a troop of 600 men with him, but his son Jonathan attacked the Philistine garrison alone, well, with his armor bearer, but single handedly he put the garrison to flight. Something like that is going on in the passage here this morning. God, as it were, has forces standing by idly whilst one single-handedly enters the fray. And that wasn't due to any incompetence on the part of God, but rather because Jesus, uh, we learn from verse 53, refused to call them, refused to ask assistance, and went to battle alone. It was as if in this battle then God would not commit his forces to the battle, but held them in reserve, unnecessary reserve. Verse 53, Do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? How then could the scripture be fulfilled that it must happen thus? That isn't what always happens. God doesn't always keep his, his heavenly forces standing idle, but that's what happened on this occasion. Sometimes, God intervenes with mighty power for our encouragement. He sends heaven's legions to the aid of his people when they're in distress. You see that many times through the history of Scripture, don't you? For instance, David in 1 Samuel 19, Saul is determined to liquidate David, and David is on the run and escapes from him. Saul's men go to David's house, and David's wife, who was Saul's daughter, Michael, uh, she helped him escape. And he runs to Samuel, the prophet, at Naoth. And so Saul sends a posse to arrest him at Naoth. 
But when they arrive at Naoth, they find a group of the prophets who are praising God and prophesying. And the Spirit of God descends upon the posse, and they find themselves compelled to join the prophets in praising and prophesying. And when Saul hears about it, he sends a second posse of soldiers, and then a third. And each time, it resulted in the same way, with the men he had sent to arrest David, praising and prophesying with the prophets. And so so Saul concludes, well, if you want to get a job done, you best do it yourself. And he heads off for Naoth. He's going to capture David himself. But as soon as he arrives, the Spirit of God falls upon him, and he could do nothing to apprehend or to harm David. All he could do was join in the praise and the prophesying of the prophets. It was as if the Spirit of God put a straitjacket on Saul so that he could do nothing to harm David. It's as if heaven's legions intervened, as it were, and held Saul in a state of helplessness on that occasion. That was about 1000 BC. You can come on then to 2 Kings 6 and Elisha, 850 BC. And there's Elisha. Um, And the Syrian army and the king of Syria is very upset because he thinks there must be a traitor in his ranks because somehow his plans are constantly being revealed to the king of Israel because whatever he sought to do, the king of Israel knew about it ahead of time. And so he wants to know who is the traitor in the high command of the Syrian army, the inner circle of his government. And one of his men says, well, it's none of us. It's Elisha the prophet. He tells the king of Israel the plans that you make in your bedroom. And so he says, as if this would be hidden from Elisha, well, where can we find him? Let's send troops to apprehend this prophet, to capture him and bring him back here. And they say he's in Dothan, the town in the north of Israel. And so the king of Syria sends a detachment of troops with cavalry and chariots, and they surround Dothan to capture Elisha. And in the morning, the servant of Elisha goes out of the house to begin his daily duties, and he turns on his heels and runs back into Elisha, and he says, there are Syrians everywhere. The army surrounds the city. Soldiers, chariots, horsemen. What are we going to do? And Elisha says to his servants, don't worry. There are more with us than those who are against us. More with us than with them and he prays and asks God to open the eyes of his servant and his servant sees that the whole town and Elisha is surrounded by chariots of fire. God's army there to help and protect his servant Elisha and you can read the rest of that story yourself when you go home perhaps or you can go to 701 BC to King Hezekiah and there's Sennacherib king of Assyria laying siege to to Jerusalem in the annals of Sennacherib he says he had Hezekiah shut up like a bird in a cage and he had reduced 46 of Judah's towns and now he's about to reduce Jerusalem and Hezekiah himself and there he is and the whole situation seems so hopeless for Jerusalem. And then something very strange happens. As Sennacherib is strutting around and sending his messenger to Hezekiah and making all his threats and his boasts, asking, what nation is there that has ever been delivered from my hand? What God is there who is able to deliver people from me? And then something strange happens. We told in 1 Kings chapter 19 that the angel of the Lord that night went through the camp The mighty Assyrian army in one night was struck down, 185,000 troops. And Sennacherib had to go back to Assyria with his tail between his legs because his army had been decimated. God had intervened. Or go on to 600 BC, to Daniel's three friends in Daniel 3. And there's the great golden image set up by Nebuchadnezzar on the plain of Dura. And everybody who valued their life was expected to bow down and worship the image at the appointed time and in the appointed way. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused. When that whole plain 
filled with people, fall to the ground like wheat before a scythe. Three men are left standing. And the king finds out about it. And he summons them. And he's furious with them. And they simply say in reply, We're not going to serve your gods. We're not going to bow down to your image that you have set up. And as a result, they're thrown into a furnace. And then Nebuchadnezzar is called to look in. And he says, didn't we throw three men into the furnace? I see four unbound and walking around. And one is like the son of the gods. God had intervened again. A fourth was walking with his servants in the fire and no harm came to them. You see, what scripture shows us time and again is that nothing can stop God from defending his people. Nothing can stop God from sending heavenly legions to intervene on the behalf of his people whenever he chooses to do so. Sometimes God intervenes with mighty power for our encouragement. And it's not just in the pages of Scripture that this happens, is it? Is it? But time and time again, God has done this for his servants. Theodore Beezer was the successor to Calvin in uh, Geneva. And whilst uh, Calvin was still alive, Beezer went on a journey. He went into France where there was a civil war. Uh, it was around about 1561. And he was trying to support the Protestant believers in in France. And in his last testament, he says that in the 22 months that he was in France at that time, he could enumerate 600 deliverances that either he or other Protestant believers experienced at that time. And he gives solemn praise to God for them in his last will and testament. That's what God does. Psalm 34 says the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear, them, fear him and delivers them. God intervenes with power for our encouragement. But once, God, as it were, curtailed his power in order to work our redemption. He limited it. He restrained it in order that we might be redeemed. And that's highlighted for us here in this passage uh, this, this morning. Now, this sort of thing can often be misunderstood. The fact that someone doesn't use power doesn't mean that there's an absence of power. That's the mistake that Peter makes here. And we need to bear it in mind. Evidently, that's what Peter thought. If you're not using power, it must be that you don't have power. And that was a mistake. In verses 51 and 52, we see that Peter thought that when someone was coming against you, you have to meet them with the same courage and determination and force. That's how Peter thought. And so Peter draws his sword and lunges at a soldier and probably because he wasn't used to handling a sword, he was after all a fisherman, he aimed to chop the man's head in half, no doubt, but he misses his target and just manages to cut off the man's ear. But you see, Peter knew what he had to do. He knew that you've got to meet power with power. You meet force with force. He didn't lack courage to fight. So, he, as he said, he was willing to die with Jesus. That's the protestation he made, and it was true. Willing to fight a losing battle. There was no way this battle could be won, but he was willing to take up arms for his saviour. Now, Luke tells us in his account that the Lord Jesus heal this man's ear. Matthew doesn't bother to tell us about that. He thinks that's a needless detail. I know if I had my ear cut off by Peter, I wouldn't think it was a needless detail uh, to know that it would be restored. Um, but that's Matthew's point of view here. That's not a big issue for him. Matthew ignores it because he wants us to listen to what Jesus says in verse 53 as he answers Peter. There are times, he says, to Peter, when an exercise of power is not the right way forward. Peter, don't you think that I'm without resources? Don't, don't you realize that even now I, I could appeal to my father and he would send 12 legions of angels at once to serve me? Now, if you want to get mathematical about it, 
A legion, a Roman legion, was 6,000 strong, supported with 120 cavalry. So if you want to get mathematical, you'd say he's talking here about more than 72,000 angels. One angel destroyed 185,000 Syrian soldiers. Jesus says, don't you realize? I am not without resources. I am not without power. But there are times when an exhibition of raw power is not the right way. Peter, you've got to learn this lesson. What we're told in verse 54 is that God always exercises his power or withholds his power in tandem with the scriptures. How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? In other words, if you are going to put up an armed opposition to this, to prevent my arrest and so on, then how are the scriptures going to come to pass which say, say that this must take place? And it must take place in this way, in my submission to suffering and death. We read in Isaiah 53, don't we, about the suffering servant of the Lord. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb to the slaughter, like a sheep before the shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. The Lord was pleased to crush him. He has submitted him to death. He was counted among the transgressors. Or Zechariah 13. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against my fellow. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Or the words of Jehovah himself in Zechariah 12, verse 10, in that very mysterious and yet clear statement in which God himself says, They shall look upon me whom they pierce. So this was the way that Jesus was to go. This was not the time for him to resist or for anyone to resist on his part because the scriptures have said that it must happen this way. Heaven's army, as it were, is withheld. They're confined to barracks and seeming defeat is going to be the way to victory for Jesus. And sometimes, you see, we have to learn as Christians that defeat is the only way to victory. There's a famous story of a private in the Marines, John Steele, 101st Airborne, uh, parachuted into France on D-Day, one of the first men in there, and the planes transporting the troops overshot the drop zone, and as a result, the regiment dropped into the middle of a French town called saint mary Glise, which happened to be a German garrison. And as they fell, John Steele's parachute caught on the steeple of the local church. And that's where he hung for two hours while there was a firefight going on below him. And early on, he tried to cut himself free, but he dropped his knife. And the wall around him was hit with machine gun fire all around him and one bullet actually pierced his foot so he could do nothing he just hung there as if he were dead and after the battle came to an end the Germans cut him down and took him prisoner you see if he had struggled if he had exercised the little strength and power that he had he would have been riddled with bullets he'd be a dead man but his apparent weakness was his deliverance there's something of that in the cross. It was a time when God curtailed his power in order to achieve redemption for us. If he had exercised his power, our redemption would not have occurred. This was the only way, through weakness and apparent defeat. Just imagine 72,000 mighty angelic spirits and they are, as it were, chomping at the bit to intervene on behalf of the Son of God. They see what's happening. They're ready to go in a moment. And the Father gives a preemptive order. Stand down. Stay where you are. Once God curtailed his power in order that we might be redeemed. And frequently, you see, God, God reproduces. He repeats this crucifixion method in our experience as the people of God. 
And what Jesus met with here when God did not exercise his power to deliver him, him, that's something that Christians also experience throughout their lives. There are times when God withholds his mighty power and permits us to go through suffering and distress and trial and tragedy and calamity. Hebrews 11, 32 and following sums up uh, the passage we are referring to, or we refer to as um, the heroes of faith, doesn't it? Just turn to that passage. If you have your Bibles, you might do the same. Hebrews 11 and verse 32. What more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings, of scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens, in caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Did you see that? Hebrews 11, verse 32 to 35, talks about all the amazing deliverances of God's power worked through his servants. Quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the alien. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Talks about all these amazing deliverances then that God provided for his servants marvelous deliverances but then without taking a breath without a break the writer continues still others were tortured not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection still others had trial of mockings and scourgings yes of chains and imprisonment they were stoned sawn into tempted slain with the sword They wandered in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. Some of you will have heard the so-called televangelists on religious TV, and you can hear them now listening to Hebrews 11, verse 35 to 38, and saying, That's not the will of God for your life. There must have been something deficient about these people. Something weak about their faith. If they had to live like that, they weren't claiming God's blessing in the way in which they were supposed to do. But that's not what the text says. Because after you've gone through all the positives and then all the negatives, he says in verse 39, and all these have obtained a good testimony through faith. So, blessings and deliverances, but trials and disaster too, coming to people of faith. And Peter saw this in his own experience later on in Acts chapter 12. James the Apostle is arrested by Herod and thrown into prison and beheaded. And when Herod sees that it pleases Uh, the people he arrests Peter and intends to do exactly the same to Peter but that night an angel of the Lord delivers Peter from the prison do you think the church was praying for James to be delivered of course they were but he was beheaded do you think the church was praying for Peter to be delivered well we know that they were we are told that they were and he was delivered and the church didn't believe it When he knocked the door, the girl went to tell them that Peter was standing at the door. They said it must be his ghost. They thought he was already dead. God curtailing his power. 
God exercising his power. Powerful deliverances and mysterious hardships. And as the people of God, we can experience either of those and both of those. Sometimes God will, as it were, is to send angels, legions to deliver. And sometimes he doesn't. And that doesn't mean, when he doesn't, that there's any deficiency of faith. Isn't that what Paul tells us in Philippians 3 verse 10 when he says, I want to know Christ. Well, what do you mean, Paul? I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. I want to know these deliverances. I want to know these victories. But then he goes on to say something else, doesn't he? I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And sometimes it's one and sometimes it's the other. Alan Gardner was an English missionary, went to various world, places in the world to take the gospel to people uh, who had never heard before. He perished on that little archipelago of islands south of Argentina with five others who had travelled with him. Their provisions had been exhausted and other planned provisions had failed to arrive. And so they were in dire straits. Gardner wrote in his journal that the pangs of thirst were almost intolerable. There they were, far from home, far from their loved ones, weakened and broken by their distress. In fact, when they found, found him, he was wearing three suits of clothes and woolen socks pulled up over his hands to his elbows to ward off the numbing cold. But whilst he was still able, he wrote passages of scripture in his notebook. One was... Psalm 34, verse 10. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger. Those who wait on the Lord shall not lack any good thing. And yet he died there of starvation. A servant of the Lord who went to take the gospel out to those who've never heard the gospel before, starved to death. Sometimes heaven's legions don't intervene. And just think of your own dilemmas. Sometimes it's physical affliction, sometimes it's disease. And God doesn't rescue you from it. And sometimes it's a need for employment or the loss of employment. And God doesn't keep you from the loss and the pain of it. Sometimes it's conflict in a relationship that just goes on and on and you never seem to be delivered from it. Sometimes it's severe temptation and you long for a speedy deliverance and yet the the ravages of it just keep on coming the legions of heaven strain at the leash to fly to your help and the father says as he said before stay i intend that this servant of mine walk the same path my son walked i want him i want her to to press on in the way whilst you remain here. I want them to triumph through weakness, as my son did. So when God's legions stay back, it's not because God lacks power to help you. It's not because you lack faith that this happens. It's because God has willed to bring his purpose about in weakness, rather than through a display of his power as he did to the Lord Jesus at the cross. And so Jesus says to Peter, and this is the lesson Peter had to learn, and that we must learn, do you think that I cannot now pray my Father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? Let's pray. O Lord my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. And yet there are other times, Lord, when we've cried out, Why are you so far from helping me, so far from the words of my groaning? We confess, Lord, that there must be those times when it must be said to us, This is the way the master went, should not the servant tread it still? So when you design for us to take the hard way, the way of weakness and sorrow, we pray that you'd give us grace for that. And we pray that you would give us grace to leave all of our needs 
all of our emergencies in the hands of your divine wisdom and in all our perplexities help us to see that you are the God who supplies whether that be in power or in weakness. Amen. Amen.